I wanted to know, you know, what information are you getting from these people of why gold was brought down? Was there a reason? And how did they do it? Well, gold uh, price reduction was achieved through dumping of um, uh, futures contracts uh, on the COMEX exchange. Notice that these takedowns in the gold price typically happen during New York trading hours. And the COMEX tends to be one of the one of the preferred venues uh, to achieve such things. And when you see the equivalent of, uh, say, a thousand metric tons of gold in paper form and futures contracts being dumped on the market in a very, 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 very short period of time, you know, in a matter of maybe hours or over over even at most a 24 hour period, um, that that's that's literally like literally like taking a, a bazooka to kill a mosquito. I mean, it's it overwhelms the system. It overwhelms the uh, uh, what we know as the price discovery mechanism uh, for gold, because the gold price, as it's presented to us uh, on screens and, and through you know through TVs, uh, doesn't know the difference between a physical ounce and, and a paper ounce or or a futures uh, ounce of gold, and uh, so so this way the uh, and, and when we talk about also, just just to be completely clear here, when we talk about a thousand metric tons of paper contract gold being uh, sold in, in, in this extremely short period of time, you know, bear in mind that the world uh, mine production for a year is somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 3000 metric tons. So when, when you have futures contracts representing a third of global output being dumped on the market at once, uh, it overwhelms the system. Uh, you know, uh, the price discovery mechanism, which I would argue is not even price discovery. And it, and it also shows very clearly that the people doing the selling or the entity doing the selling uh, is is not trying to get the best price for their product. It 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 has all the earmarks of being uh, uh, as opposed to trying to maximize the price for the good that they're selling. It's like they they're trying to achieve a a breakdown in the pricing mechanism. And when and when you think about you know if if you want to just think in terms of economics 101 for anybody who maybe studied economics uh, because a lot of people have at some point in their academic lives uh, we're taught that the basic tenets of supply and demand uh, is that uh, you know people are always trying to achieve the best price they can for for their output or for the goods that they're selling and what we see repeatedly in the precious metals market is uh, you know, a activity that would suggest exactly the opposite. It's it's sort of like, the, you, you know, it's being telegraphed that they're trying to get the least possible they can for, for what they're selling. And, and that's, and that's what identifies this activity as being, as being fraudulent and being politically motivated as opposed, if it's not profit motivated, it's got to be politically motivated. Anyway, I hope that serves as somewhat of an explanation. From, your contacts, when prices are brought down, um, you know, by 50, by $100 uh, per ounce, do you see central banks or countries or investors just gobbling up the gold? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, when when the price is attacked like this, it, it, it isn't really uh, uh, it isn't really because people have liquidated physical positions. The, these price takedowns are achieved by selling imaginary, uh, you know, yet to be mined or gold that does not exist. And it's just that the price discovery mechanism can't tell the difference between a physical ounce and, and, and a paper ounce. But I mean, we, we what we see every time there is a takedown, Dave, is is like for people in America and, and up here in Canada, too, we see record typically we see record sales uh, volumes on uh gold eagles silver eagles in canada gold maples silver maples 
And every time they smash the price, these things become, uh, let's just say, less available. And it causes a, it causes a, a you know, a lineup of people saying, I, I would love to have some at the, at the new reduced price. And what it typically does is it, 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 it creates waiting time. Uh, often, often when the prices are attacked the way they, the way they have been recently, uh, you know, the, the wait times for getting metal uh, tend to get lengthened. So as opposed to being able to go to a, a dealer in precious metal and, and do cash and carry for, 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 a, for a big box of coins, you might have to pay today and get them in two or three weeks uh, when demand surges. And typically the demand surges when we have these price breakdowns. Rob, I wanted to transition over to what is happening in Europe with uh, Deutsche Bank, the Italian banks. Right now, I mean, we see what is happening where Deutsche Bank is in trouble. Do you think the central bankers are right now, are, are they in crisis mode? I, I believe they are. But I would, I would su suggest this with regard to Deutsche Bank. Mm -hmm. The difference between Deutsche Bank and, say, J.P. Morgan Chase is, in my view, who they report to. Uh, Deutsche Bank reports to uh, our, the ultimate reporting authority in Germany is, is a, an organization called Baffin. And Baffin is extremely uh, independent, uh, vigorously so. And th these people uh, enforce uh, probity in, in their banking system. That's the mission that they're charged with to make sure there's no hokey pokey going on. The uh, American banking, uh, com, you know, uh, systemically dangerous institutions like the Morgans, the Cities, the, the B of A's, the Goldman's and the Morgan Stanley's. These are institutions <coughs> that ultimately uh, uh, report to the Federal Reserve. And these are the institutions that are chosen to uh, it, let's just say, enforce or perpetuate the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. So the the activities that these banks like J.P. Morgan are engaged in underpin uh, the, the, the perpetuation of the dollar as, as the uh, global uh, reserve currency and, and, and unit of trade. Like, all all commodities in the world basically trade in U.S. dollars. Oil trades in U.S. dollars. The the you know lumber trades in U.S. dollars. Uh, grain trades in U.S. dollars, and we live in a U.S. dollar centric system, or have up until very recently, when a lot of bilateral trade agreements have been struck between the Chinese, the Indians, the Russians, the Brazilians where they are uh, making uh, arrangements and are, 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 are building facilities where they can transact directly in their currencies as opposed to the dollar. And in a world where foreign central banks uh, hold trillions of dollars in their reserve accounts, this becomes problematic when countries uh, that have reserves are suddenly not doing business in dollars because what it does is it undermines the, the rationale or the reason for them to actually hold dollars. And when they sell their dollars or if they sell their dollars, the dollars return home. And that can be and will become a, a very, very inflationary uh, in nature and likely uh, uh, will cause problems in the future, uh, probably causing more problems than anyone cares to admit right now. But anyway, the, the big difference between Deutsche Bank and, and, and JP Morgan is who they report to. And when Baffin uh, raided Deutsche Bank's offices a number of years back, uh, I've been, it's been alluded to me by people who are close to German leadership that they were horrified with what they found and I would suggest to you what they found was that uh, Deutsche Bank was basically engaged in activities that were 
largely geared towards the perpetuation of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. That would be inconsistent with Baffin's mandate uh, because Baffin would not view Deutsche Bank's uh, raison d'etre to be the perpetuation of the U.S. dollar. And this, this, would, this would have deeply upset them. And this is why uh, Deutsche Bank was given new, new marching orders. Uh, but so, and just to bring this full circle, because I'm comparing Deutsche Bank to J.P. Morgan and saying that the difference is who they report to, if, if Deutsche Bank is truly as financially sick as pundits claim, uh, because much, much of this, this argument that they're, that they're in trouble rests on the size and, and on the makeup of their derivatives book, J.P. Morgan's derivatives book probably now is probably much bigger than Deutsche Bank's because Deutsche Bank has been trimming theirs back dramatically over the last two years. And J.P. Morgan's derivatives are the same, are exactly the same composition of whatever Deutsche Bank had on their books or off their books, because the uh, uh, derivatives contracts that these institutions hold uh, in in many trillions uh, uh, of size or notional, um, these are off balance sheet items. So if if Deutsche Bank is sick from their derivatives book, by extension. It means that Morgan is sick, Citi is sick, B of A is sick, and Goldman is sick, and so is Morgan Stanley, because they all have the same stuff in their derivatives books. Realistically, um, the stress tests that the central bank performs on these banks, to me, it's they're, more of... They're a farce. Yeah, I was going to say, it's they're more a propaganda. Farce. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they're as believable as U.S. media coverage of the election. Do you think they'll let Deutsche Bank collapse if it's that bad off? Or do you think the German government will bail them out? Or do you think they will bail in? Or do you think maybe they'll find an investor to fund the bank for a little while longer? Well, the way I view it is that if the globalists have determined that the financial system or the financial edifice is is not uh, robust enough to continue in its current form, they may very well uh, initiate a collapse of Deutsche Bank, and this way they can blame the Germans. Hmm. And that's that you know is sort of a recurring thing with the globalists. I mean, I mean, the Second World War was blamed on the Germans. The First World War was blamed on the Germans, uh, which brought brought on the reparations which set the stage for the Second World War. And now here we are, we've got a German bank being effectively demonized uh, in the Western press. And I would, I would say the reality of what's occurring with Deutsche Bank is they're being brought to heel by regulators actually acting in a responsible fashion. You see, and the reason this doesn't happen to the American banks is that the Federal Reserve views the uh, American banks as the muscle to perpetuate the dollar. So they, their their worldview is much different than German regulators. Yeah. And uh, and and would they use a Deutsche Bank? Uh, th there was a saying by a famous uh, American politician, someone very close to the presidency, who said they never like to let a good crisis go to waste. Or, or, or uh, you know, a, a, a good calamity go to waste. So they, they, they use they the globalists are very, very uh, ruthless in in using these calamities as uh, to achieve greater and bigger things. So yeah, w w would would I put it past them to collapse Deutsche Bank? Uh, you know, as as a as a scapegoat. And to try and hopefully, you know, create a pile of ashes that they can, you know, then resurrect something new, uh, more of more to their liking from from the, the carnage. Quite possible. Um, but I mean, if if Deutsche Bank is sick and, and bad, you, you know that there's a there's a host of others that are in the same boat. If they do allow Deutsche Bank to crash. What effect does it have on other banks and U.S. banks, Canadian banks, Australian banks, U.K. banks? What would happen? My view is we'd have a systemic 
uh, it, to me, to me, these banks are all lined up like dominoes. Mm. And if one of these big systemically important banks goes down, I believe it brings down a, a whole pile of them. But at the end of the day, my, my, my worldview is that we are approaching a time where we're going to get a global reset in our financial system anyway. And they may just use this as the trigger to initiate such a thing. Now, you did mention the elections and they're coming up uh, this November. And of course, we have Hillary Clinton and Trump. Um, we talked a little bit about this before um, we started to broadcast the interview. But from your perspective, do you think the elite, if, if the elections aren't going in the direction they want, do you think they'll allow the elections to happen and they will allow, let's say, Trump to move into the office of the presidency? Or do you think they have something else up their sleeves? I, to begin with, I, I put nothing past the globalist entity. Um, the, the election in America, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, to me, is a, a referendum on globalism, whether Americans are going to stand uh, you know, for being run by globalists or whether America is going to stand for, uh, uh, you know, its own nationalist self-interest. To me, that's what the what the election boils down to with Hillary Clinton being the globalist candidate and Trump being the, uh, the patriot and the nationalist candidate. And that's leaving leaving their leaving their policies and their and, you know, and the and the and the sex sex crap behind it, it boils down to uh, globalism versus nationalism. The globalists are are ruthlessly eugenics oriented, and and have stated over the past four or five decades their desire to have the global population reduced dramatically. They are anti-human, and for that reason. I side with the nationalist candidate, and I don't know how good a president he'd be at all. But I'll take I'll take nationalism over globalism any day. So I, I, whether or not the globalist will allow Trump to actually ascend to the presidency, should he win? Um, the, let's just say uh, there's a growing there's a growing sentiment amongst. Uh, people that I talk to who are engaged in uh, commentating on financial issues, geopolitical issues, I would say there's a growing consensus that the globalists will likely, uh, we, we say, flip the tables over uh, hmm. before, before there would be allowed to be an election result where Trump would win. So I think we're in for a very, very, very interesting, uh, uh, possibly diabolically interesting next three weeks in the run-up to the, to the actual election day in America. Personally, I think there's very good chance we might see something happen that would uh, allow the Democratic uh, President Obama to possibly suspend or cancel the election. And whether that would be initiated through the starting of a war, a, a hot war with with Russia, or whether that could involve an assassination of a political candidate, um, these these are things that I think are all on the menu uh, by the globalists, because these people are are they're lecherous. They are lecherous, dangerous people, and they are probably the worst threat humanity has ever experienced in, in, in recorded history. And these people will stop at nothing to achieve their means, and they are very, very dangerous, and, uh, and I put nothing past them at all. So I think we're in for an extremely interesting next three weeks. It's, it's, it's an amazing time to be alive with what is going on in, in our space. It really feels like we have a perfect storm heading our way. I mean, we have the elections coming up. We have the economy deteriorating, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. All the private Western Central Bank countries, they're, they're deteriorating very, very quickly. 
We have DHS making sure that nothing happens to the election system. And then we have word that Obama is going to instruct the CIA to pick out targets in Russia to cyber attack. From your viewpoint, where do you think we are headed with that? If there is some type of cyber attack where the United States attacks Russia, what do you well, think Russia's next move would be? My, my belief to begin with is that um, polls that are being uh, polls that are being announced or that are being reported in the mainstream or dinosaur press in, 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 in America have been severely skewed in, in, in a manner to give it, to give an example, if, if, if a, if a poll is being conducted where they, let's just say if there's a CNN poll where, where they're going to call a thousand people to get their opinions on who's going to win the election, what's been occurring and it's been documented that they would, for instance, phone 600 known Democrat supporters uh, to 400, uh, 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 let's just say, random people who may be Republican, Democrat or other. And then on the basis of them doing that 1000 person uh, uh, poll uh, or sample, uh, they'll make a pronouncement that you know, Hillary's ahead by 10 points. Well, if you phone known Democrats uh, uh, to get your to get your poll results, you're, you're going to have a, you know, a Democrat in the lead of, of any such poll. This is what's being done. And, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a travesty. It, it's, it's, dis, it's purposeful disinformation on the part of all the mainstream outlets in America who are completely in the tank for, for the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton. And it's, it's, it's completely the opposite to what uh, uh, the fiduciary duty of, of, of a supposed free press, what, you know, supposed free press is, is charged with, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a democratic society is charged with doing investigative, honest investigative uh, journalism and, and, and reporting real news. But what we're, what we're being fed is, is, is so ridiculously biased and they're so clearly in the tank for the Democrats that it's, that's a complete and utter joke. So, you know, we're not, we're not being fed good information. Um, the the and and the reason for this is the media is completely owned by the globalists and i mean that's that's that is literally uh the result of you know what five four or five major corporations owning owning the media and the concentration of media in in such few hands uh, it becomes a, a very easy job for globalist minded entities to you know, have their way with them, you know, through through bribes, threats, or otherwise. And this is what we're seeing, and it's and it's very and it's very very sad and quite disturbing uh, to see this. And whether these people are going to ever allow Trump uh, uh, to to you know to win the day, I, I I don't I don't see it happening. If I was a globalist, I would do whatever was required to, to, to make sure that that result didn't happen. And I just think, I think we're going to, what we're likely to see in the next three weeks will, will be earth shaking and earth moving and likely alters the course of humanity in a very, very substantial way. Are you talking about war? Yes. I'm talking about war. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, you know, quite possibly the suspension of the Constitution in America, martial law, or or maybe or maybe a big big nuclear war that makes all of this moot. Now, why would they do this? Why would they push war? I mean, they know if we move towards war and we actually have war and we end up with nuclear war, they know that you know people are going to die. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of damage. There's going to be people starving to death. It's not going to be a, a good situation for anybody. 
Why would they want war? Um, to begin with, globalists are very, very, very sick sociopaths. And they're like, like I said earlier, their, their goal is to have dramatic population reduction on the planet. And these globalists are, are literally so sick that they believe a nuclear war is winnable. And you see they because they have their bunkers and they, they feel that they can have a nuclear war and win somehow and and emerge from their bunkers after they've radi irradiated the world and and emerge and and declare victory and and this is literally how sick these individuals are and when you think about it dave mm -hmm. it, it, when when you look when you look at who they're the horse that they're running in this in this race for the presidency they're they're effectively i i, I re like to refer to it as hillary is clearly a very very sick ill person she is not she is not with it whether whether she has uh you know what like whatever kind of uh, neurological shortcoming she has i've 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 watched the video of her doing a face plant like she she literally can't i mean dave who takes 20 days off uh, uh 28 days before a, a national election in america I mean, after the last debate, uh, her 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 campaign said that she's going to be basically in hiding for the next twenty days. I mean, it's 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 like it's unbelievable. It's it's without precedent. It's never occurred before. And I mean, she has one foot in the glue factory already. This is a person who is not well. I mean, just just for her from the standpoint of her own health. Why why are they running this person? This this person is not fit to take office, and and I, like just physically isn't up to the challenge. And uh, anyway, it's it it's it's beyond it's beyond rational thought why this is occurring, other than you know you're dealing with a very very big pile of sick puppies, and I don't know what else to say. It's it's shameful. It's beyond shameful. Do you, do you think everything that they're doing right now is to cover up everything the uh, governments, the central banks have been doing for the last 50, 60, 100 years? Because like you said earlier, the dollar is at its end. Um, the dollar will be coming back to the United States. The petrodollar system in the Middle East is completely just at its end game right now. And what we're seeing is that everything is just starting to deteriorate, crumble, and it looks like the only alternative they have to cover up everything that they've done is to have war. And especially if they don't get their candidate into the the White House, they're like pretty much done. And well, I mean, it was Dave. It was the last debate where where Trump basically gave Hillary, uh, you know, the 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 walking directions of what's going to occur if and when he becomes president he said you're going to be investigated and you're going to jail so like hillary's all in because she she has to be like i and i mean and so from from a hillary from a very sick individual's perspective she's done no matter what happens like she's done if they have or you can say humanity's done if we have a war but she doesn't care because she's done if she loses so when people are in a position, especially people who are in uh, positions of extreme power and they're and they're confronted with a, a, a no win situation, um, you know, they might behave in a way that wouldn't be very responsible. And that's, you know, we're, we're seeing we're seeing the, the groundwork being laid for these people to conduct and act in very irresponsible ways. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully the good people in the U.S. military won't allow these sick individuals to, you know, bring about the undoing of mankind. From everything that you've been looking at, what would you give the time frame of when all of this would happen, when uh, the economy would completely collapse, war would happen? Where in what time frame do you think that all this is going to happen? I mean, I, I would I would. I would expect 
we could see some we could see some absolutely crazy things prior to the election and if there's an election uh, some absolutely crazy things could follow from it so you know let's just say the next month or month and a half or two months is going to be a very 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 interesting period of time to be alive <laughs> and hopefully we remain alive i i hope so yes hey rob thank you very much for being on the x22 report spotlight once again how can people see your work uh you can find me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com rob once again thank you very much for being on the spotlight i appreciate it i wanted to know you know what information are you getting from these people of why gold was brought down? Was there a reason? And how did they do it? Well, gold uh, price reduction was achieved through dumping of um, uh, futures contracts uh, on the COMEX exchange. Notice that these takedowns in the gold price typically happen during New York trading hours. And the COMEX tends to be one of the one of the preferred venues uh, to achieve such things. And when you see the equivalent of, uh, say, a thousand metric tons of gold in paper form and futures contracts being dumped on the market in a very, 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 very short period of time, you know, in a matter of maybe hours or over over even at most a 24 hour period, um, that that's that's literally like literally like taking a, a bazooka to kill a mosquito. I mean, it's it overwhelms the system. It overwhelms the uh, uh, what we know as the price discovery mechanism uh, for gold because the gold price as it's presented to us uh, on screens and, and through, you know, through TVs uh, doesn't know the difference between a physical ounce and, and a paper ounce or, or a futures uh, ounce of gold. And uh, so, so this way, the, uh, and, and when we talk about also, just, just to be completely clear here, when we talk about a thousand metric tons of paper contract gold being uh, sold in, in, in this extremely short period of time, you know, bear in mind that the world uh, mine production for a year is somewhere in the in the neighborhood of 3000 metric tons. So when when you have futures contracts representing a third of global output being dumped on the market at once, uh, it overwhelms the system. You know, uh, the price discovery mechanism which I would argue is not even price discovery and it and it also shows very clearly that the people doing the selling or the entity doing the selling uh, is is not trying to get the best price for their product. It 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 has all the earmarks of being uh, uh, as opposed to trying to maximize the price for the good that they're selling. It's like they they're trying to achieve a a breakdown in the pricing mechanism. And when and when you think about you know if if you want to just think in terms of economics 101 for anybody who maybe studied economics uh, because a lot of people have at some point in their academic lives uh, we're taught that the basic tenets of supply and demand uh, is that uh, you know people are always trying to achieve the best price they can for for their output or for the goods that they're selling and what we see repeatedly in the precious metals market is, uh, you know, a activity that would suggest exactly the opposite. It's it's sort of like, the, you you know, it's being telegraphed that they're trying to get the least possible they can for for what they're selling, and and that's and that's what identifies this activity as being as being fraudulent. And being politically motivated, as opposed, if it's not profit motivated, it's got to be politically motivated. Anyway, I hope that serves as somewhat of an explanation. From your contacts, when prices are brought down, um, you know, by fifty, by a hundred dollars uh, per ounce, do you see central banks or countries or investors just gobbling up the gold? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, when when the price is attacked like this. It, it it isn't really uh, uh, it isn't really because people have liquidated physical positions. 
the, these price takedowns are achieved by selling imaginary, uh, you know, yet to be mined or gold that does not exist. And it's just that the price discovery mechanism can't tell the difference between a physical ounce and, and, and a paper ounce. But I mean, we, we what we see every time there is a takedown, Dave, is mm -hmm. is like for people in America and, and up here in Canada, too, we see record. Typically, we see record sales uh, volumes on uh, gold eagles, silver eagles in Canada, gold maples, silver maples. And every time they smash the price, these things become, uh, let's just say, less available. And it causes a it causes a, a you know a lineup of people saying I, I would love to have some at the at the new reduced price, and what it typically does is it 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 creates waiting time, uh, often often when the prices are attacked the way they the way they have been recently, uh, you know the, the wait times for getting metal uh, tend to get lengthened. So as opposed to being able to go to a, a dealer in precious metal and, and do cash and carry for, 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 a, for a big box of coins, you might have to pay today and get them in two or three weeks uh, when demand surges. And typically the demand surges when we have these price breakdowns. Rob, I wanted to transition over to what is happening in Europe with uh, Deutsche Bank, the Italian banks. Right now, I mean, we see what is happening where Deutsche Bank is in trouble. Do you think the central bankers are right now, are, are they in crisis mode? I, I believe they are. But I would, I would su w suggest this with regard to Deutsche Bank. Mm -hmm. The difference between Deutsche Bank and, say, J.P. Morgan Chase is, in my view, who they report to. Uh, Deutsche Bank reports to uh, our, the ultimate reporting authority in Germany is, is a, an organization called Baffin. And Baffin is extremely uh, independent, uh, vigorously so. And th these people uh, enforce uh, probity in, in their banking system. That's the mission that they're charged with to make sure there's no hokey pokey going on. The uh, American banking, uh, you know, uh, systemically dangerous institutions like the Morgans, the Cities, the, the B of A's, the Goldman's and the Morgan Stanley's. These are institutions <coughs> that ultimately uh, uh, report to the Federal Reserve. And these are the institutions that are chosen to uh, it, let's just say, enforce or perpetuate the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. So the the activities that these banks like J.P. Morgan are engaged in underpin uh, the, the, the perpetuation of the dollar as, as the uh, global uh, reserve currency and, and, and unit of trade. Like, all all commodities in the world basically trade in U.S. dollars. Oil trades in U.S. dollars. The the you know lumber trades in U.S. dollars. Uh, grain trades in U.S. dollars, and we live in a U.S. dollar centric system, or have up until very recently, when a lot of bilateral trade agreements have been struck between the Chinese, the Indians, the Russians, the Brazilians where they are uh, making uh, arrangements and are, 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 are building facilities where they can transact directly in their currencies as opposed to the dollar. And in a world where foreign central banks uh, hold trillions of dollars in their reserve accounts, this becomes problematic when countries uh, that have reserves are suddenly not doing business in dollars because what it does is it undermines the, the rationale or the reason for them to actually hold dollars. And when they sell their dollars or if they sell their dollars, the dollars return home. And that can be and will become a, a very, very inflationary uh, in nature and likely uh, uh, will cause problems 
in the future, at probably causing more problems than anyone cares to admit right now. But anyway, the, the big difference between Deutsche Bank and, and, and JP Morgan is who they report to. And when Baffin uh, raided Deutsche Bank's offices a number of years back, uh, I've been, it's been alluded to me by people who are close to German leadership that they were horrified with what they found. And I would suggest to you what they found was that uh, Deutsche Bank was basically engaged in activities that were largely geared towards the perpetuation of the US dollar as the global reserve currency. That would be inconsistent with Baffin's mandate uh, because Baffin would not view Deutsche Bank's uh, raison d'etre to be the perpetuation of the US dollar. And this, this, would, this would have deeply upset them. And this is why uh, Deutsche Bank was given new, new marching orders. Uh, but so, and just to bring this full circle, because I'm comparing Deutsche Bank to JP Morgan and saying that the difference is who they report to. If, if Deutsche Bank is truly as financially sick as pundits claim, uh, because much, much of this, this argument that they're, that they're in trouble rests on the size and, and on the makeup of their derivatives book, JP Morgan's derivatives book probably now is probably much bigger than Deutsche Bank's because Deutsche Bank has been trimming theirs back dramatically over the last two years. And JP Morgan's derivatives are the same, are exactly the same composition of whatever Deutsche Bank had on their books or off their books, because the uh, uh, derivatives contracts that these institutions hold uh, in, in many trillions uh, uh, of size or notional, um, these are off balance sheet items. So if, if Deutsche Bank is sick from their derivatives book, by extension, it means that Morgan is sick, Citi is sick, B of A is sick, and Goldman is sick, and so is Morgan Stanley, because they all have the same stuff in their derivatives books. Realistically, um, the stress tests that the central bank performs on these banks, to me, it's they're, more of... They're a farce. Yeah, I was going to say, it's they're more a prop 